Hello guys, welcome to Railworks Explained. In the following 5 or so minutes, we will discuss one revolutionary decision of Japanese authorities from the 1950s. It was a decision that will soon after make a significant impact on the travel by rail and the transport in general. It was a decision to invest a huge amount of money and efforts to construct something that was supposed to enable the unthinkable. A high-speed travel of passengers using the railways. This elusive dream to make railways competitive even with air traffic became reality when the world's first high-speed railway line between Tokyo and Osaka opened for traffic in the autumn of 1964. It is no exaggeration to say that opening of this line marked the beginning of a new era of train travel. Actually, Japan was eminently suited for this kind of investment, bearing in mind that its population of 125 million people is mostly concentrated in large cities on the coastal plains 160 kilometers or 100 miles apart. To understand circumstances leading to the decision to construct this railway line, it is important to understand some trends in Japan's society during and before the decision took place. First, the post-war Japan's economy with American aid was actually booming, and the number of transported passengers between the major cities was increasing rapidly. The old 500 kilometers or 310 miles long railway line between Tokyo and Osaka was country's most heavily used railway line, accounting for a staggering 25% of passenger and freight traffic carried by Japanese national railways. On the other hand, in terms of the length, this line accounted for only 3% of Japan's total railway network. Eventually, Japanese national railways decided that rather to attempt to quadruple the existing tracks of this line, to actually build a new route that would allow faster trains to run on a completely separate alignment. Thus, the concept of high-speed railway lines was born, aimed at not only enabling passengers to travel faster, but crucially to boost infrastructure capacity dramatically by providing an entirely new railway route, uncluttered by local services or freight trains. Also, it allows for more intensive usage of infrastructure, because the number of trains a line can accommodate is greatly reduced if trains run at lower or different speeds. In order to ensure the line, dubbed Shinkansen, which means literally the new trunk line, or the new main line, was kept physically separate from the rest of the network. It was built to the standard gauge, in contrast to the narrow gauge used elsewhere on the Japanese railways. This route, also known as Tokaido Shinkansen route, established a template for future high-speed railway projects, which means there were dedicated tracks, no sharp curves, no level crossings, in-cap signaling was a must, and a very limited number of stations. This and future Shinkansen railway lines were effectively the motorways of railways, with a few junctions and stops, but fortunately with no equivalent of service motorway stations such as gas or toll facilities. Works on the Tokaido Shinkansen, funded by the World Bank, started in April 1959 and took five years, with the first trains running for the Olympics, which started in October 1964. Construction was a major engineering feat since, unlike the old 19th century Japanese railway lines, the Shinkansen was built with a few curves as possible, thus requiring the construction of countless bridges and viaducts, which accounted for a third of the total length. Most of the intermediate stations were put on loops of the main running line to allow trains to stop without losing a significant amount of time. Inevitably, the project costs nearly doubled initial estimates, but met the deadline of serving the Olympics. The trains operated initially at 200 km per hour or 125 miles per hour, which might not seem quite revolutionary for today's high-speed standards, but keep in mind it was 1964 and that this speed slashed the journey time between the two cities from 6 hours and 40 minutes to just 3 hours and 10 minutes. Also, while trains run smoothly and reliably, there also were some unexpected problems. Notably, the pain caused to people's ears by the high air pressure created when two trains crossed each other in one of the numerous tunnels which comprised a total of 74 kilometers or 46 miles of the route. The powerful air currents generated during these tunnel crossings tended to, for example, blow the water up from the toilet bowls, contributing to the hapless user's embarrassment. As a result, the trains, which were already fitted with air conditioning and triple glazed windows, had to be pressurized, which was an expensive and technically difficult requirement. However, 
e-rake and misbehaving toilets did not deter the passengers. Within three months, 11 million people had traveled on the line and it took only three years for the first 100 million passengers to be carried. As a result, and unlikely the most high-speed projects even today, the Shinkansen was soon generating substantial profits even taking into account interest payments on the costs of the construction. This success later led to the publication of a plan of a network of 7,200 kilometers or 4,474 miles of high-speed railway lines to be completed by 1985. However, the plan proved to be too optimistic. Works started on two new lines in 1971, but the expansion plans became surprisingly controversial despite the success of the first Shinkansen. The proliferation of viaducts and bridges on the Tokaido line guaranteed that the noise from the frequent trains was spread far and wide, and also the railway was obliged to make expensive infrastructure changes, pushing up the costs of construction. Concrete bridges, rather than steel ones, became the norm, and wherever the line passed through a built-up area, walls had to be built to contain the noise from the wheels. Even then, Opponents were not satisfied and while this problem has been particularly acute in densely populated Japan, other countries which just started to build their high-speed lines have encountered similar opposition. In a world where motorways cross both urban and rural areas with impunity, new railways seem to generate far more opposition than appears reasonable given their limited impact on the environment. Japan was not isolated case in that sense. In the Great Britain, for example, two motorways were built through a county of Kent in the 1960s, but the Channel Tunnel Rail Link generated far more protests by the local residents. In addition, Japan was hit by the oil crisis in the 1973, which, while helping the railways by pushing up the cost of fuel, also had a negative effect as the consequent recession reduced the passenger numbers. Plans for the high-speed network were scaled back, but never at less, not only have half of the planned lines been built, accounting to nearly 3,500 kilometers or 2,175 miles, but services have been accelerated so that today's Shinkansen trains travel at 300 kilometers per hour or 186 miles per hour. This is practically the same as the most European high-speed services, but also there are plans for further speed increases, considering the Shinkansen has proved to be a tremendous boom for Japan's economy. The high-speed rail has played an impressive part in reducing transportation costs and also limiting the nation's oil imports. The International Institute for Applied System Analysis found the Shinkansen serving the same route to be nearly three times more productive than aircraft in terms of labor efficiency, five times more effective in terms of capital costs on equipment, and eight times more effective in terms of energy consumption. Yet, despite the success of the Shinkansen, it was over a decade before any other country would rival Japan's achievement. There was widespread interest across the world in improving the speed of express trains, from their discouraging advantage of 100 km per hour or 62 miles per hour, as high-speed technology was seen as the only way of the salvation of the obsolete railway passenger transport. At the time, motorways were relatively congestion-free, and cars could easily achieve the same or higher speeds as express trains, with the added advantage of providing a door-to-door -door service. Among some other factors, this caused the long-term underinvestment and neglect of railway sector by the policymakers. However, times has changed. But this is the topic for some of the future projects on Railways Explained. Thank you very much for your attention. As always, we hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. For the end, we would like to ask you to like this video if you do like it, share it with your real loving friends and of course for more interesting railway stories, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Until the next video, goodbye.